Alright, check this out. In my last ship build, I went over the process for building a Guardian Ruins optimized Diamondback Explorer. And in a recent video, I also detailed where you can find Guardian Ruins and what types of Guardian Ruins there are in the galaxy. This build will now assume that you've taken aspects from both of the previous videos and now you want to come back in and build a cutting edge Diamondback Explorer that is taking full advantage of both Guardian modules and engineering. This is not a credit expensive build, but it is highly engineering intensive and could take a week or two of gameplay in order to get everything dialed in. But you don't have to have everything perfect in order to start having fun. So there are some concessions that I make and some personal tastes in how this build is laid out that differ from the meta but offer some specific advantages that I at least enjoy and that I think a lot more commanders will probably be able to, to make use of than not. If you disagree with what's in this video, feel free to experiment. A lot of the fun things that have happened in this game come from commanders testing new stuff out and I tend to be one of those aggressive testers. So, core internals. Exploration ships tend to utilize lightweight alloy, which is the stock alloy all ships come with. Heavy duty grade 5, deep plating. Takes advantage of the percentage based engineering that really can't do anything to add mass because the lightweight alloy is considered to have zero mass. So you get a boost to your absolute all integrity without costing you anything but the engineering materials needed to apply the blueprint. Now most exploration builds will equip the smallest power plant that is feasible on the build. I tend to do that with larger ships more aggressively than with smaller ones because the cost in module weight definitely becomes a bigger deal on large ships. However, in this case I've opted to go for a size 4A power plant for a couple of reasons. The, the big one being low emissions grade 5 reduces a power plant's energy output in favor of also greatly reducing its heat. Uh, thermal spread increases efficiency even more so that we get an efficiency of 0.13 which is the best you can get through the engineering system. This means that the heat that your ship collects from its modules during operation is minimized and that means that when you go to fuel scoop that it's a lot easier to get closer to the star and stay there for long periods of time without overheating. Thrusters, 4D, dirty grade 5, drag drives. I tend to like D-rated thrusters better for exploration because they draw less power and have less mass, but their performance is affected. Dirty drives helps you get back closer to what the A-rated thrusters would put out, but it does not get you all the way there. You do not need to have A-rated thrusters or clean drives to explore high-G worlds. These thrusters will work just fine. In fact, any size thruster will. The game kind of cheats a little bit and boosts your thruster output so that you always have just enough thrust to be able to escape any planet that the game will let you physically land on. You do, however, suffer an increase in the amount of heat that your thrusters will generate when you're on a higher G planet. If you try to escape something like a 9 or a 10 G world with 4D thrusters, you're going to take a significant heat penalty as a result of the dirty drive blueprint. I find that it is better to overcome that with a heat sink launcher than it is to try to do it with clean drives because clean drives actually draw more power from the reactor than dirty drives and so tend to produce more heat. The 5A frame shift drive in this blueprint doesn't indicate it, but I've actually gone in here and custom applied the tech broker frame shift drive that's currently available from human tech brokers. I have a video dedicated to this. I highly recommend you go and watch it so you see what this drive does because it is hands down the most desirable frameshift drive in this game for exploration. Now, it does not come with an experimental effect. You have to go add mass manager. So when you get this drive, take it to Felicity Varsier or anyone else who has FSD blueprints and apply this because it, it really brings this drive to life. 3D life support, lightweight grade 5, keep the mass down as much as possible. Power distributors are one of the interesting deviations in this game. A lot of explorers will go for a size 1D because it's the lightest you can possibly stick on any ship. Uh, even though these are indicated in red by Coriolis, this indicator is not that you cannot equip the module. It is that if the module is equipped in its stock form, it will not allow you to boost. 3D sensors, lightweight grade 5, optional internals. The 4A fuel scoop is essential on the Diamondback Explorer. I highly recommend this. You can get away with a B. It costs you just a little bit more time. But you'll be fuel scooping a lot on long transits, and this minute and a half refuel time is kind of painful. It's one of the areas where the Diamondback Explorer is the most weak. It's why the low emissions reactor is so essential. 
If you have to fuel scoop for a whole minute and a half, you want to make sure your ship's running as cool as possible because it will let you take that whole minute and a half in one shot rather than trying to adjust your distance to manage heat. It makes long trips just that much easier. For a Guardian Frameshift Drive Booster, leveraging the best that this ship can possibly put. There is one size bigger if you have a medium ship you can take advantage of that gets you a little over 10 light years, but 9.3 is nothing to scoff at. You definitely want to have this on your ship because it's free jump range and jump range increases travel efficiency. 3D Shield Generator. For core exploration builds there's not really a lot of reasons to run A-rated shields unless you are planning to get into a combat situation or you know you're going into a hazardous environment like a spatial anomaly where the shields could take damage. Not a lot of explorers do either one, uh, and especially the combat part. This ship is made of tissue paper even with shields. These are really what I would consider to be navigational shields. They give you some free forgiveness if you happen to bump something or hit the ground a little hard, your shields will protect you. A 3A auto field maintenance unit. This is because there is a myth going around among explorers that 3Bs are better for synthesis efficiency because they have more ammo, but their repair rate is lower which means that the 3B auto field maintenance unit repairs less module integrity per full charge. 3A is better for synthesis efficiency. You can augment the 3A auto field maintenance unit's performance with synthesis. You can increase the repair rate dramatically. Some neutron highway ships like to take advantage of this because it minimizes downtime between neutron highway cycles. That's up to you. Uh, I still like the 3A because it does have the best repair rate in the game and uh, having a good repair rate is a little bit helpful if you know you're going to do neutron jumps. Now this ship is fully capable of that. If you want to do neutron jumping in a Diamondback with an AFM, a single AFM, you can definitely make that work. A lot of commanders also like to run two AFMs. This is ostensibly for a measure of redundancy in case one gets damaged, but having gone to Beagle Point twice, which is about as far away from the bubble as you can get, I've never run into a situation where you need to. Neutron jumping is probably the most dangerous thing you can do travel-wise, and it's actually not that dangerous. It's it's really easy. I've done Beagle Point using the Neutron Highway. Like, don't, don't let people intimidate you. There's just a little technique that you apply. I can do a video about that here uh, coming up. I'm going to try and get that done here sometime soon. I, I won't make promises because my, uh, my life situation is a little complicated right now. I like, as a stylistic choice, to have a cargo rack on exploration ships, at least one because even though there aren't a lot of uses for one now, the developers may add features that you can go out and collect, and there are actually some research-related materials that you can collect that are commodity-based. For example, if you collect tissue samples or find certain types of Guardian tech, uh, you need to be able to put it in your cargo hold to move it around. If you were to use this ship for Guardian ruins, you would need a cargo rack in order to load Guardian keys from a beacon and take them to a ruin. It's a small cargo rack, it's not that big of a sacrifice, and I would greatly prefer having this in my ship than having a second AFM. 2G planetary vehicle hangar. This is because the G is lighter weight, but does draw more power. Power is not that big of a deal. Uh, the 2H draws less power, but weighs more. I don't know a lot of explorers who prefer that, but if you're running a power-constrained exploration build and you want to sacrifice jump range, that's a viable option. The two size one modules are for Super Cruise Assist and the Detailed Surface Scanner. Super Cruise Assist is essential, I believe, because it lets you put the game on literal autopilot and go do other things while your ship navigates between two points. This is especially handy when exploring binary star systems, because your flight times can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hell, some of these systems could have flight times extending greater than an hour. Super Cruise Assist lets you lock on to a stellar body that you want to explore next, and go do something else while your ship navigates to the system during that time. It's a, a real headache saver. And it's cheap. It doesn't draw a lot of power. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Detailed surface scanner is a requirement if you want to do any kind of surface mapping. And since surface mapping represents a substantial portion of your ability to generate revenue, it's a good thing to have. Um, you can engineer it. The blueprint's pretty good. There's only one and the engineers to unlock it aren't very high level, so you can get access to them relatively quick. There is a CG version of this blueprint floating around, this module with a special blueprint. You could call it a grade six probe scanning radius, and effectively it lets you go to planets that require six probes and scan them with two. If you're lucky enough to have this module, definitely consider putting it on a ship like this, because it's easy. 
But most of the people I knew who have that module are far enough along in the game that, uh, that they're sticking it on a large ship. I, I put mine on my Beluga. I'll get into the Beluga build in the future. Hard points. For Guardian Ruins, you need to have an energy weapon in order to trip the beacons. I use a pulse laser, grade 5 lightweight with flow control to keep the power under control. You could put another experimental in here to your heart's content. Flow control is just my default because it's an exploration ship. You could strip this down, but stripping it down doesn't take a lot of weight off, so I did power. Stylistic choice, it's all up to you. Uh, the two mediums I tend to leave empty, even though you could lower power draw even more by putting a medium on, but for the pulse laser can also pull double duty as close air support at a guardian ruin, so you can shoot down drones and stuff for your friends. So I like having something that's closer to the ship's center line for accurate aiming. Heat sink launcher. I put lightweight on because the heat sink launcher is a heavier utility, but you can do ammo capacity. That gives you a little bit more synthesis efficiency. It does cost you some jump range, but 1.3 tons isn't that bad. I think the ammo capacity yeah, doubles it, so it's like 2.4 or something. It's still not that bad for a ship like this with a frame shift drive this size. And then a point defense, lightweighted because why not? You don't really need to engineer the point defense, though. I just had the materials sitting around, and it is if you had the materials, it's the blueprint that you would want to apply here, just because it gets you closer to a, a better jump range. Although we are talking about an unladen range of 70.91 light years here, which is crazy. This is just a few light years short of the best that the Anaconda can do, and it's kicked the Diamondback Explorer right back up to the top of the field. It's never really left it that far. I think it was like in third or fourth place six months ago. Still right near the top of the list, and very cost effective. You can grind these credits out in a couple of hours of gameplay and basically have everything you need to buy all the base modules, assuming that you have permission to buy the Frameshift Drive Booster which is one of the more difficult ones to acquire on this list. If you want to know how, you can refer back to my previous video on Guardian Ruins. That is this build in a nutshell. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them below, and I will catch you later.